This is the Darren Paltrow cast with Darren Paltrowitz. I've been interviewing musicians, comedians, and all sorts of entertainers for almost 20 years. Joan Rivers, Flavor Flav, Paris Hilton, members of Guns N' Roses and the Eagles, and countless others. This show is about artists and why they do what they do. On this episode of the Paltrowcast, I spoke with three people from very different backgrounds. Dragon Force guitarist Herman Lee, professional wrestler MJF, and singer, songwriter, and producer extraordinaire Amani Coppola. First up is my interview with Herman Lee from Dragon Force, whose band just released a new album called Extreme Power Metal. Dragon Force, a lot of people call the fastest band in the world. Whatever you want to call them, they are very entertaining. In my opinion, they are potentially going to be the heir apparent to Iron Maiden in terms of being a band that draws big crowds, plays really fast, exciting music, and keeps metal alive for decades to come. Herman was a real pleasure to speak with, and I think that really comes through in our chat. When did you start making this new album? Uh, We started last year. um, I mean, the recording started around the summer, I believe after the summer, actually. Uh, So probably, I think, October. And then the writing started, you know, a few months before that, you know, six months before that, probably. And do you remember which song you recorded first for the album? Well, all of them, you pretty much record all of them at the same time. Um, You start with the drums and then just go through each instrument one by one. Now, with the writing process of Dragon Force, that's not something that I've read a lot about. Does it usually start with somebody writing and sending a demo over? Or are you guys usually in the same room for when you're actually writing? Uh, we're never in the same room. Usually, like on this album, Sam would write the basic of the songs and he would just, you know, he'll send it to, to all of us to check out and we'll get our input in. That's how we, that's how we did it on this album. And in your case, being a band that everyone calls, you know, the fastest band in the world, do you like that tag? Or is that a lot of pressure that you can't write slow songs and you don't like that? I mean, it, it, all these labeling doesn't really bother me, you know, so it's, it's all good to me. I mean, you know, we are. I mean, I mean, I never thought we're fast, but apparently we are. So, you know, they can say that. But it, it's, it's cool. I mean, it's kind of funny. You know, we don't we don't take things too seriously. So we don't have to have a serious, serious label each time to describe our music. And then in terms of playing so fast, though, obviously everyone's going to ask, how did you become such a fast guitar player? But I'm curious in terms of how you maintain being such a fast player. Are you the kind of person that plays hours a day or do you really not pick up the guitar much when you're not touring or in the studio? Well, I mean, I play every day, but, um, you know, I don't sit there doing hours and hours. So it's almost like, you know, an athlete, right? Um, you, you can't just, I mean, you, you kind of maintain your body, but not until you have like a, I guess, a comp- competition that you would, you know, kind of get up to that level that you need. And it's because it's actually hard to maintain that kind of level that we do on tour, tw- you know, every single day of the year when you're not touring, you need a break. So um, we we get practice when it's time to, you know, get on tour and play this, play this stuff. Well, in the case of maintaining your body and all that, I can't imagine that you guys travel with a masseuse per se, but are you the kind of guy that's stretching before he goes on stage or are you the person that's holding court like, say, Ronnie James Dio would, where he's talking to everybody and socializing and that's how he gets loose? <laughs> I know Sam, he stretches, you know, before the, before the show. Um, I personally don't. I don't. I never really damage my hands or anything, so I require any stretching. Um, so I... I make sure I play, but I don't play too much and overplay and hurt myself. Um, so I'm usually kind of a, in a good in a good position to do things. Um, but the body, you know, because we do jump around and run around on stage, so that needs a bit of work on the rest of the body. The fingers are okay. And have you been pain free this whole time? Because a lot of artists, I think around that 30, 35 year old mark, they kind of realize, oh, I need to slow down a bit. But when I look at you on stage in a live video now versus 10, 15 years ago, when I started listening to Dragon Force, you don't seem like you've slowed down a step. No, I think we've gone more over the top. At least I have with the stage stuff I'm doing, with the stage moves of like, you know, doing flying, knee, knee, flying knees onto the guitar and catching it in the air. I guess, um, it's just evolving the way I play the guitar on stage. I, 
I just enjoy, you know, taking to another level, you know, from playing on stage to all the way playing inside the pool and snorkeling with the guitar. Uh, so <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, um, I'm just having fun out there. And when you started playing guitar, were you able to do moves while you were playing in the early days of guitar? Or did you really have to perfect your craft and look down at what you're playing, master that, and then you could actually start being animated? It took many, many years, and I'm still working on it. And not just playing the guitar, but you have to play in front of the audience and test these things out. So it's actually hours and hours, you know, days, years of touring that I'm able to get these moves out. Um, I can't perform the same moves, actually, when I'm at home. You need something like an audience to make it happen. So I tested these things live first. <laughs> yeah. Was guitar your first instrument, or did you start out like most people with piano lessons? No, that, the only thing I can play is actually the guitar. Yeah, I started relatively late. I started when I was 16. Wow, you started at 16. So what were your passions or the things that consumed all of your energy before you started playing guitar? playing video games <laughs> yeah you know so you know that's why they say you know dragon Ball is like nintendo metal or something because we got lots of inspiration from video games video game sound video games music and is it still mostly guitar and video games for you or did you find new hobbies given that you've now been around the world many times over and you're regularly talking to people all over the world i mean by traveling around the world you definitely learn different things of different culture and the great things around the world so i think everything has an effect in what you do and what um you express and throughout the i mean other um, other other things i'm into are like martial arts i'm into cars you know you know driving track racing cars and you know learning about the mechanics so pretty much um everything matter because it reflects in the lyrics and music and people say oh you just like dangerous stuff like martial arts and sports cars that's kind of like or fast and over the top so i guess that's kind of my style i mean not that i'm going to compete in x games and do those crazy things but you know everything i do is a, a little bit i guess fast and over the top <laughs> that's that's a very interesting way of looking at things that everything you do is fast and over the top wow i didn't think of that and and did you start doing martial arts for the sake of self-defense or exercise or it looked cool and you said i want to do that too i think i just found it very interesting mechanically Me the science of it the mechanical the thing of just you know just the whole thing about it i mean self-defense is cool but let's let's take reality in it and it's you know these days people are just going to shoot you or something um, so i would never recommend anyone to learn martial arts they're going to have self-defense on the streets i'd say run away if there's a confrontation, just run away, escape, never confront the situation as a fight. So, you know, uh, so, but, um, I just enjoy, I, it's just like fixing, you know, just like cars is very scientific driving, you know, how to drive a car fast around a racetrack is very technical, just like martial arts and guitars. So I like the technical aspect. Probably that comes from my computer background. I'm really into, you know, electronics and computers. And then back to Dragon Force. You're at this interesting point in your career where you guys don't need hit songs to keep, you know, playing to big audiences. And arguably, it's getting bigger and better every tour, every album and all that. Who are some of the bands that you guys look at and go, that's who we want to be in 15 years? We don't have that mentality to go, you know, uh, we want to be the biggest band in the world. I mean, we want to do the best we can do. That's what we are. Um, but, you know, just to say, oh, well, we want to do that. That's kind of a, you look at it as a business point of view. Artistic is very important and we're going to play the music the way we want and not try to fit in with everyone else. Say, well, if we write music like this, we might get bigger. It just doesn't work that way. Um, so, you know, let's, let's be honest. You know, any kind of business and music band, you, you know, you get your up and down. If you don't get your up and downs, you haven't really experienced life the way it should be done done and you know going up and down will make you learn different things you know um in the band and we have you know massive hits and we have some one album that didn't do as well as the other one like that come after and then another one that do better so um it's good that we get to experience the up and down in life and learn from it but it sounds like it's in up right now given that you have this new record out and you know what the next year or two looks like am i right yeah this is actually the biggest album release we've ever had it's crazy this is like the I mean, the hype is so, I mean, it's so big now. There's so much buzz on it. The music videos are like, people are just going crazy on it. 
So we're really looking forward to it. And we have, you know, learned different things in the past to make this album the biggest release. And, you know, the songs are better, you know, than I think, I hardly say the songs are better. They, but it really captures everything Dragon Force is about along with the artwork of the new album and how we're putting the visual, like the music videos along with the music. Great. So in closing, any last words for the kids? Um, you know, I want to thank everybody who's been listening to us and supporting us. And of course, um, go, you know, follow our social media, get updated when we come and play on tour. You know, ho- hopefully they can catch it. And also check out my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash Herman Lee, which we're actually bringing that on tour. So you're going to see exclusive stuff. You know, we recorded a lot of the album actually live stream on the internet. So people already seen you know, stuff that we do that we've never reviewed before. So I um, want to take the fans on this kind of a fun journey with us. Great. Thank you very much for your time and looking forward to seeing you in New York very soon. Thank you so much, Darren. Next up is my interview with MJF, which is short for Maxwell Jacob Friedman or Maxwell J. Friedman. Max or Maxwell, I don't want to get slapped for calling him the wrong name, is one of the top professional wrestlers out there. He is with a new company called AEW, or All Elite Wrestling, which premiered on TNT in the U.S. on October 2nd, the day that this podcast came out. I had the pleasure of having MJF over my apartment in Long Beach, New York. He was extremely generous to make the trip out, to say the least. And I think it's a very interesting look into a person that many people think is a character, but MJF is not a character. He is a multifaceted performer. He is clearly an athlete. He's clearly a personality. He's clearly an actor. He's a very talented guy. And if you're not familiar with his work, you really should be in the near future. This is going to be a big, big star in the years to come. So everybody knows that you are the fastest, youngest rising star in professional wrestling accurate but, but what else do you wish more people knew about mjf i just wish more people knew how humble i was i don't feel like that, that comes across well enough i mean i have all these talents i have all these skills i'm ridiculously good looking and yet i'm still able to sit down here in this disgusting apartment with an awful view and i'm still you know i'm still basically happy you know and i think that just goes to show how good of a person i am how salt of the earth i am Absolutely. And you're going to be on national television regularly in a couple of weeks. Yeah. But not everybody realizes that you've been on lots of TV before. Sure. And do you like the idea of being on television? If I, I, I love the, like the prospect of TV because it's, it's even more so long-form storytelling than you would get with a movie. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas a movie, you, know, you kind of have to jam-pack a whole entire story in an hour and a half, two hours... Um, watching Lord of the Rings and I want to you know rip my eyeballs out of my face three hours and a half um, but with TV it constantly leaves you at a cliffhanger and you can go for six seasons seven seasons eight you know however successful the show's going to be and to me AEW are going to be around for a really long time and I can really sink my teeth into the fact that I'm going to be able to portray myself however I'd like uh, as both a entertainer as an, as an athlete and evolve as a person in front of everybody's very eyes for, you know, God, ho- however long I feel like it, to be completely honest. Yeah. Uh, I've already shined a se- uh, signed a sheet of paper. I'm, I have the longest contract of any active roster member in all of All Elite Wrestling, which is pretty wild, but it's, it seems about right and about fair considering how much money I signed for. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm really happy with everything. And do you think that there's anything that people have wrong about you besides you not necessarily being the salt of the earth? Man, um, I, I think the biggest thing is I'd like to say I'm more than just a wrestler. I've had, I, I have so many different things that go in my background. I mean, I was, I was a very serious football player. I was, mm-hmm. I was very into acting, um, choir, a cappella. I mean, I, I really was a jack of all trades when I was growing up as a kid. And it's what's going to be cool is how I'm going to be able to kind of infuse all of those talents into weekly TV once I see it deems fit. Looking at the people that you're working alongside, like your best friend Cody Rhodes. He's the best. The roller coaster is the best. And uh, Dallas, who yep. you have worked with on DDP yoga stuff, or you just know him as a friend? Oh, yeah. No, DDPY, man. It, it's so funny. The, the first time... Um, like he brought it up to me. I met him at a housewarming party for at Cody's house, actually. 
And it was so wild. He walked up to me and he was so friendly. He said, MJF. And I was like, oh, snap. Okay, so like, you know, you know my work. And we got to talking. And this is somebody that, you know, I've looked up to my whole entire life. And uh, it was just cool. They took an interest in me, what I was doing. And then I was explaining to him that I'm 23 and I have back pain, you know, and my joints hurt. And he explained to me what DDPY was, and at first I was like, ah, nah, that sounds like yoga. I don't want to do yoga. Yoga is for women or very frail men. I'm not interested. And he was like, no, come on, bro, you gotta try it. And uh, I did it, and now I I feel like I'm completely invincible. I've never been in better shape in my entire life. My flexibility is through the roof. Um, I have no pain in my neck, my back, my knees, my joints. I mean, DDPY works, and I think if you're, especially if you're an athlete, you would have to be a complete idiot not to at least try it. You mentioned that before that you originally had back pain and all that, and everybody who watches you, you know, now versus four or five months ago knows, wow, this guy literally is in the best shape of his life. What is it that inspired you to go that route to actually get in the best shape of your life was well, it being on tv i think that well the fact of that people are going to be looking at me half naked every week <laughs> is definitely you know a little uh, it's a push uh but besides that you know i i want to be the best professional wrestler in the world i want to be the best athlete in the world i want when people to watch our program to be like oh mjf by far by you know miles is the best thing that they have on that tv show whether that be on the microphone or in the ring, in the back, in the office. I just, I don't want anyone to ever look at me and think, oh, he's great at all of this except that. I don't want to have one weak point. I don't want one. And uh, that's something I've always prided enough myself on since I was a little kid. Granted, if there was something I wasn't interested in, it meant nothing to me. Mm -hmm. And I would just push it over to the side. Uh, like, uh, for example, me and school never got along. And I think that's why me and Dallas um, kind of, got real close real quick because we have a lot of similarities like I was not good at reading like I was really bad at reading and it almost felt like teachers would pit, like call me out to read in front of the class almost as like haha this is funny for us mm -hmm. and that sucked I had terrible attention deficit disorder it took a lot for you to get me to sit down and care about what you were talking about sure <laughs> you had to be a very charismatic person or I had to care about the subject matter so when I found things that I did care about like acting, like wrestling, like football, um, it was just like, oh, I'm really good at this. Mm -hmm. and I'm really good at this because I'm passionate about it. And uh, that's that's what I love about wrestling is, and, and the second that goes away, I'm going to stop. But for now, it's I'm just so in love with every aspect of my business. We've talked about it briefly here, but you've talked about it in general, that you were a standout high school football player and that led to you getting a college scholarship within football yes was the goal ever to play in the nfl you know it's so funny i wanted to play in the nfl just so i would be more appealing to <laughs> to a wwe because there was no aew at that point right so in my head i was like okay i'm going to be the best middle linebacker in college sports then i'm going to go play in the nfl for like a year or two and i'll be famous and i'll be able to call vince mcmahon on his cell phone and say hey book me <laughs> Um, so that was my game plan. But once I got to that college, I immediately felt it in my bones. And I'm like, I don't know if it, yeah, it's probably like, I've, I've always had like this sixth sense. I'm very good at reading people. I'm very good at reading situations. Right. Um, and I just knew I wasn't supposed to be there. I wasn't. And I remember calling my parents and being like, hey, I just, I'm going to come home. And then like laughing at me over like, no, no, you're not. You're not going anywhere. So then when I did come home, it was, it was definitely uh, not easy, but they understood the sincerity in my voice and my face that I knew what I wanted to do. I didn't want to waste away four years playing college football at the prospect of playing in the NFL so I can get noticed for professional wrestling when I could just literally start doing mm -hmm. <laughs> professional wrestling. And uh, that's what I did for four years until I got signed to AEW. And this is intended to be a compliment. You're a lot more multifaceted and interesting than somebody you'd think of as being a, a football player. It's almost like what you said where somebody goes, what is he using football as a stepping stool for? 
is wrestling the same kind of way? Are you trying to use that as a stepping stone for something? Or is this really that something that you do hope to be doing until you're 40 or 50? It's something I'm legitimately passionate about, and I will always be involved in professional wrestling in some way, shape, or form. But I'm also incredibly passionate about acting. That is something I want to do um, once I feel I've um, accomplished all my goals in wrestling. Um, I'm never going to leave. I'm never going to leave AEW. I'm not fucking going anywhere. <laughs> but um, I definitely want to, would start wanting to venture out into the acting world mm -hmm. and show that I I think I could be you know the next Rock. I think I could be, I think I could be or a, I think I could be a De Niro. I think I could be an Al Pacino. I feel like I can be a very good, very serious actor once I feel I've plugged in all the goals in wrestling. Well, you're associated with the knowledge of you being better than everybody sure. else character or not character and pardon my use of the word character here the better than you you're actually somebody that people can look at and go that guy is better than yeah, me yeah. a lot of no, stuff it's, it's not a gimmick it's not a character it's a way of life i feel and i do i walk into every room and i own it and i feel if everyone did that they'd be much happier so instead of judging and booing maybe people should just look in the mirror and be like huh why can't i say i'm better than you and you know it what do i need to work on what do i need to fix about myself you know, but has that belief in yourself always been there? When you were five or six years old, did you know that you were better than? Yeah, people? I mean, I announced live on the Rosie O'Donnell show when I was five. I said I'm going to be a professional wrestler, and I knew that was true. Like I knew deep down that was true. I remember I had a, uh, I remember I had so many you know detractors, so many people just being like, "You're a five foot ten white Jewish kid from Long Island," like. You're nuts. This isn't going to happen. It's not going to happen for you. You should focus on your studies. You should focus on school. Uh, become a doctor or a lawyer or something that I would, you know, bash my brains in doing. <laughs> um, and I just always knew, like, mm, nope, you're wrong. And I just, I always knew better. Right. And that also came with a lot of hate because no one, no one likes the kid that calls his shot and then makes it. That's the worst because then you're deemed as arrogant or conceited. I always just looked at it as, I just always knew what I wanted. I just always knew what I wanted to do and who I wanted to be. And uh, I wish more people were, were able to do that. We're able to have a goal, a dream, and achieve it. And going back to what you were saying here about being Jewish, and originally, if we think about Jews in wrestling, we know Macho Man was half Jewish, mm -hmm. and Goldberg was maybe the biggest wrestling star yeah. that was Jewish to date. But we also see today Colt Cabana mm -hmm. and David Starr, and different people are turning out to be Jewish. When did you realize that it was okay to be Jewish in wrestling and outward about it? Oh, man. I don't know if it is. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, I kid, but it, it, it was it's interesting. I've never talked about being Jewish in a promo, ever. Um, and it, But my name, it's just so blatantly a Jewish name. You know, it's not like my name is Maxwell Jacob Smith. It's Maxwell Jacob Friedman, <laughs> right? And uh, so you would go to you would go to towns, and you people would say like a lot of anti-Semitic slurs, or you know, and and it was it was tough in that sense. But also, I looked at it as I'm making people mad. I'm eliciting a reaction. So who cares? So I was fine with it. But it was definitely there have been there's been so much stuff and I don't even know if it's necessarily because I'm Jewish but I've had my car keyed my bumper kicked in um, I've had people throw batteries and piss at me um, I had one guy thread me with a blade by my car after a show in Indiana um, and he was wildly drunk uh, so I've had a lot of close calls uh, I don't know if that's necessarily because I'm Jewish or if that's just because of who I am as a person when I go out there and I wrestle bell to bell but I have found now more than ever, especially in my company, AEW, we are so open. Mm -hmm. We have people who are gay, people who are transgender, black, white, Asian. Like, we have, we have it all. We got it all. We got, we got the whole gamut. And to me, I don't give a shit. Like, I've never cared who anybody is, what their sexual, religious, or skin color is. It's always just been like, hey, how are you as a human being? Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out everybody sucks, and I'm just better than everyone else. <laughs> and that's why I hate everyone. <laughs> what are you going to do? Understandably. So it doesn't matter as long as they realize that you're better than exactly. them. Exactly. Okay. I, don't, I don't care who you're sleeping with. Just understand the pecking order. You know? <laughs> that's all that matters. <laughs> And then you synonymously grew out of Create a Pro. Yes. 
And do you look back at your Creator Pro career, you know, entirely favorably? And I ask that because a lot of people say, "Well, I wasn't trained correctly," but it seems like everyone comes out of Creator Pro happy. Um, I had some close calls at Creator Pro where I almost got kicked out of school because, again, even though I'm so passionate about wrestling, shit, I'm a handful. Uh, anybody who knows me knows I'm a handful. I'm aggressive. I'm loud. I'm obnoxious. <laughs> I'm. I say too honest. Other people say rude. I call it too honest. Um, so yeah, I had close calls there, but the thing was is Pat, uh, Buck, and Kurt Hawkins never gave up on me because they, they saw the potential and they saw my yearning and want to be great. Um, so I, I can't thank them enough for the position I'm in. I would not be in the position I'm in today without Cap to the point where I have a Creative Pro tattoo on my leg uh, permanently into my body and my skin because I want any, everyone to know that I'm here because of Creative Pro. Everybody in my school gets trained properly. Uh, we are we are we are taught how to perform at the best level, um, strategically and intelligently and safely. And I feel if you are listening to the this podcast or what whatever form that's going to be posted on, um, I would most certainly suggest if you're interested in becoming a professional wrestler, the only place that you should go in the metropolitan area is CAP. And you were directly trained by Kurt Hawkins and Pat both. Yes, uh, both of them, and then I had other people come in, like Alex Reynolds, who was a former PWG standout, mm -hmm. who was actually just on SmackDown. He got squashed in uh, Madison Square Garden, which was a big deal for all of us because it, it's still Madison Square Garden, you know? Was he uh, Alex P. Keaton, or they, yes, they, they gave him that they name? they changed his name. Okay. And he was one of my trainers early on. He is, without a shadow of a doubt, the most underrated wrestler in the world. That guy is a freak. Um, and then there was another guy named VSK who's also clinically underrated, but he's starting to make the rounds now on the independents. Um, so it would be a revolving door. I remember Trent came in one day and helped teach a class. Zach Ryder came in one day, helped teach a class. Arn Anderson came in one day. Jerry Lynn came in one day. It's just when you have a trainer like Hawkins who's just friends with everybody in the industry, people are just going to come around to help out and see what's going on at your facility. And I was just able to pick all these people's brains, and I feel like that really gave me a serious, not a leg up, maybe like two legs up and an arm over everybody. So, yeah, I can't put Creative Pro over enough. And then in terms of your overall lifestyle, is there life outside of wrestling or is between being on the road, keeping in shape, doing interviews, etc., is that really 120 hours a week? It really is, man. It's like Groundhog's Day every day. I wake <laughs> up, I have my protein, I go to the gym, I get out of the gym, I, I, I study tape, uh, go back to the gym, eat more food, uh, go to sleep like that's that's my day in a nutshell and uh, you know there are there times where I allow myself to you know go out and have some fun with some chicks and my friends absolutely I mean I'm I'm a man <laughs> but I'm a I'm a goal oriented man and I'm, I'm a work excuse me and I'm a workhorse and for me uh, there's no there's just no substitute for hard work it's just not possible. And when you bring hard work with somebody who's a prodigy and is naturally gifted and you put that together, you get a freak of nature that is me. And that is why I think everybody's talking about me so much in my industry. And uh, it's it's really cool to see. Because I've, I've, en I've envisioned all of this happening since I was little. Mm -hmm. And now that it's happening literally in front of my very eyes and I go on social media and people are saying I'm, I'm the best right now. Pe ev everyone. I, I'm listening to, to podcasts and interviews with top guys in my industry and they're talking about me mm -hmm. uh, and all these news sites about pro wrestling whether it be like uh, whatcoach.com or like shit like that like I'm I'm the main attraction I'm the main thing that people are referring to and talking about and it feels right it feels just but I know that it wouldn't be happening if it wasn't for the fact that every morning I wake up and I go to the gym and I and I study wrestling and then in terms of being goal oriented are you the kind of person that has their whole life on a calendar or a to-do list, or you just know what the greater goal is and you work towards it? Yes and no. Um, my whole independent co uh, career, I, I actually had shit physically written out on a wall, and I would check it off, and I'd check it off, check it off, check it off, until eventually there was nothing left to check off except for get signed by WWE. Uh, and then AEW came along, and I was like, oh, that sounds, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and for me, and I love WWE, I respect WWE, I respect everything they're doing, but for me, AEW was 1,000% the perfect fit. Mm -hmm. No one's been walking up to me handing me something to say, ever, um, and that, that was the biggest deal to me. It's, it's different if I'm in a movie or a play or on a TV show because you're telling me to play a character. 
Mm-hmm. The thing that I try to explain to people is MJF is not a character. MJF is literally me, and that's why nobody can give me a script because I'm 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 being MJF twenty four seven. As far as now, do I have a goal list on my phone now? I do, um, but I'm not as crazy like like staring at it as I used to be because now I am a thousand percent certain that it's all going to happen. It's mm-hmm. just a matter of time. Uh, and I think it's going to happen fast. I think I'm going to become the AEW world champion fast. I think people are going to uh, eventually say that I'm the face of my company fast. Uh, I think people are eventually going to say that I'm maybe the greatest to have ever done it. Th- those are long-term goals, but for me, they're not wild anymore. There's something that are completely conceivable. It's something that I can grasp, and it's something that I fully believe in. And then before you got to all this with signing with AEW, you were on Stone Cold's podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I imagine was a thrill. I mean, you're a bigger star than him. Everyone sure, knows that yeah, right Sure, and now. he knew too. That's why he got so <laughs> jealous and angry. He threw me out of his house. Of Cry course. baby. Cry baby. And Cry then baby. Jericho had you on his podcast a couple of weeks yeah, ago. Yeah, Chris is all right. He's whatever. <laughs> so you're meeting all these people that you grew up with, but you're pretty much contemporary to them at this point. Is there anyone you haven't met? that you know you still could meet that you're hoping to meet the only person i wanted to meet and i can't now is roddy piper mm. um and it sucks because everybody tells me he was the coolest and it, it would have been a pleasure to like just talk to that dude and pick his brain um i get compared to him all the time which is you know really cool but it would have been much cooler if i had gotten to sit down and just be like how did you do a through z and just listen and learn uh, but I never got that opportunity. If I had to think of somebody who is alive now, that's a tough question, man. Um, shit. Well, have you at least gotten to meet Teal Piper at this point? I, I met Teal. I actually ate food with Teal at the airport after All Out. She's a sweetheart. And, uh, no, she was really cool. It's, yeah, it's a hard question. I feel personally that I've met everyone I've wanted to meet in my industry. I guess maybe my, my answer would be... Uh, I would like to pick, um, no, I honestly, I don't know. I, my answer would have been Cody, but now I genuinely have a relationship with Cody. He's genuinely my friend. He, we talk to each other every day. I pick his brain every day. He, mm-hmm. he cares about me. I care about him. I want to see him succeed. He wants to see me succeed. And it's awesome because that was a guy that I was watching since I was a little kid. I, I guess if I'm reaching, I'd say Randy Orton because when I was a kid, my favorites, Cody was most certainly up there for me. But my, my number one, my absolute favorite, besides Roddy Piper, who wasn't active anymore, mm-hmm. was Orton. Mm-hmm. I felt that nobody understood how to grab an audience like he did. And mm-hmm. still to this day, it's still the same. I just watched he, I just watched his match against uh, Kobe Kingston. It was, I'm going to butcher the name of this paper. A Night of Champions? Jim? Uh, Clash of Champions? Clash of Champions. It used to be Clash of the Champions, yeah. but I guess it's Clash of Champions. Champions. They changed it. <laughs> Let them do their thing. Let yeah, their yeah, freak yeah. flag fly over at WWE. I'm just glad that they gave a lot of my friends jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but he didn't do shit. Like, he literally, he just, he would stomp on Kofi and he'd look straight at the camera and you would felt everything he did. And when he slowed the pace down, you weren't bored because he was there and he was in the ring and his presence, his presence is insane. So that is something that I think every young wrestler should be watching instead of worrying about doing their flips and their dangerous moves. Let me get you another water. <laughs> oh, yeah. Another liquid death. Uh, do we have one more liquid death? Or is this room temperature? Oh, no, no. You're going to get a different water. Oh, you're no. You're going to get flow, which flow. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow likes. Well, I'm actually very tight with Gwen, so if she enjoys it, I'll enjoy it. Yep. Just open up that box. When you get your water by the case, you know. Not an easy life there, but someone's got to do it. I mean, yeah. Does it pop open in there? Oh, there you go. Cool that it's not uh, refrigerated. Um, we'll talk. We'll talk after this recording's <laughs> over. Yeah. So uh, ultimately, Randy Orton is, of course, the top talent right there. But is there an accomplishment in your career so far that you're most proud of? I would say getting signed to All Elite Wrestling. And the reason I say that is because it was a culmination of all the hard work I did on the independents. Um, I mean, I would drive 15 hours, 16 hours to wrestle for free in these dingy little dungeon gyms in front of people that had about as many teeth as they did brain cells. <laughs> it was brutal. Uh, and I, they are not a lot of teeth. Uh, so do with that information as you will. Um, it was hard. But I, I got my name out there. I moved to the Midwest just to 
you know, because I got over in the Northeast, but people were ten- like tentative about booking me in the Midwest. And I was like, you know what? Screw you guys. Hey, everybody in the Northeast, I'm so over. Are you willing to fly me if I move to the Midwest? Sure. Mm-hmm. Moved to the Midwest, got flown out to all the Northeast shows, drove everywhere in the Midwest until everybody said, oh, we'll fly you from the Northeast. Moved back home from New York. Everybody in the Midwest flew me. Then the West Coast got it was like I was slowly taking over, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's how I looked at it. I looked at it as, you know, uh, just a, a chess game. I just put my pieces in the spots accordingly so I'd be able to take the king. And once I took the king, I got my contract. And uh, the, the coolest thing was, I'll never forget the first time I met Cody, is it was at an Alpha One show in Canada. And I just remember he saw my match and somebody walked up to me and he goes, Cody's talking about you in the other room. He's saying he was really impressed. And I was like, fuck yeah, man, sick. <laughs> so it's, it's just cool how everything, you know, landed and worked out. Because AEW becoming a thing even is just about as miraculous as the universe becoming a thing with the Big Bang. It was not supposed to happen. We're talking about a bunch of renegade guys that should have went to the WWE that decided not to and they gambled on themselves and then met Tony Khan, who's an amazing human being and had enough money to fund this awesome idea. And now we're here and we're about to be on TNT, like, that's insane. And this all happened in, not even in the span of a year. Mm-hmm. It happened in the span of months. In months, yeah. And uh, the fact that we had this much traction, this short of a period of time, is crazy. And I think people are going to be absolutely amazed when the, this quote-unquote Wednesday Night War happens. Mm-hmm. Because, um, all, you know, all due respect to the other company, I hope they do great. But I think we're going to blow everybody's minds. Like, I, I think that AEW is going to be the talk of the town the town in professional wrestling. And I think that the best wrestlers, the best um, matches are gonna be taking place in my company, so. And then two quick questions and then you're a free man. Sure. The first question is, you're one of the only talents I can think of that's embraced by Cody and all the AEW people, yet also Jim Cornette, yet also the indie people, yet also Kurt Hawkins. Sure. Why do you think that is? Because I'm as real as it gets. I do not waver. Um, I feel a lot of people will present themselves a certain way when they're on TV or at matches or with other people. Like I've said, I'm just me, man. Cody Rhodes is getting MJF. Uh, The back office at AEW is getting MJF. Tony Khan's getting MJF. The Young Bucks are getting MJF. Kenny Omega's getting MJF. The fans are getting MJF. Jim Cornette's getting MJF. Mike Trainers are getting MJF. So there's no one that can be like, oh, he was this way with me. Oh, well, no, actually, he was this way with me. <laughs> You're going to get the same guy every time. And I think people appreciate the fact that everyone else might be playing these games and might be trying to be something else that they're not. I'm just me. Um, and I feel that that has always worked out in my favor because I am unapologetic in mm-hmm. who I am. And uh, I feel like that's the only way to go. Mm-hmm. So. so in closing, any last words for the kids? Um, just don't grow up to be like your parents because I'm sure they're just fat and poor and ugly. And last but not least is my interview with Amani Coppola, whose new album, The Protagonist, is now out on Ipecac Records, the record label founded by Mike Patton of Faith No More and Mr. Bungle. Amani is somebody that I first learned about in the mid or late 90s when she had a hit on Sony called Legend of a Cowgirl. I followed her in the years since. Uh, she had some mainstream success with Little Jackie, which she was the singer and co-songwriter of. She's popped up on various one-offs and writing for people, and behind the scenes she's done a lot of jingle work and all that. But I spoke with her about her new album, and this is a very behind-the-scenes look into life as an artist. This isn't so much a, here's my new album, which, you know, the protagonist is a great album, but this is very much a look into what it's like to be an artist that survived the major label world. Hope you enjoy this really refreshing look into that. Getting to it, um, the protagonist is the new album, and your last album, I believe, was two years ago. So did you start making this one as soon as the new one came out? It was one of those situations where I had it done... Then I was looking for some sort of label, and it was just there for three years. So it wasn't like, oh, I one record out and put out another. It was, you know, I had like two years of space in between when I actually completed the one before this one. Did you know outright that it was going to come out on Ipecac, or did you make it and then you gave the album to them to see if they wanted to put it out? Yeah, that's exactly that's exactly what I did. Um, I intended to put it out myself. That was my initial intention um however i didn't even consider 
them or anyone. I was just like, well, what's the point of that? I, I made this album. They paid for nothing. And now they're going to profit on half of what I did. Like it didn't, the numbers, numbers wise, it didn't make sense for me to go the traditional route with trying to seek a label. And plus I knew it was just not mainstream at all. And I thought, you know what, why not have Ipecac put it out? You know, artist friendly, um, genre defying, you know, everything that (sighs) this album probably needed. I, I wanted to give it a little more of a exposure than my, limited amount of Facebook fans could, you know, I could give to whatever fan base. I'm not out on the road touring. I'm not an Instagram superstar. When I make a record nowadays, no one knows about it, you know? Um, So I I wanted to give it a little bit of a push and have, you know, have it, I don't know, reach a, 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 a bigger audience than I could have done by myself with my Facebook fans. Well, it's interesting as somebody who follows your career for a long time that you do all these quality oriented projects and all these collaborations with different artists, yet it's kind of hard to track in a way because, for example, there was the first rung of success with Sony and then Little Jack right. is its own major label thing. Your Ipecac stuff is its own and the stuff that you did with Maya Sharp and all that, that's entirely different. But it all is you. It's all undeniably you. So I'm curious when you figured out that there was going to be life as an artist beyond the major label support. Uh, that happened. That was kind of something I figured out sooner than later because it wasn't just label support. I needed to be able to explore as an artist and as a musician. And so I don't, I just don't believe in, in, in uh, imprisoning a young mind, a young, potentially brilliant creator and telling them to do the same fucking thing over and over. And I knew when I was 20 and they sent me in to make my second record and they wanted to hear the same fucking shit on my first record, I was like, what the fuck did I drop out of music school to do this shit for? Like, I was quite content exploring uh, the depths of my creativity and seeing where that would lead me in life. And now here I am adhering to your fucking, your, you know, assembly line fucking bullshit. Fuck you. I'm going to figure this shit out the hard way. Um, so that's basically when I uh, determined that um, I would not have really um, really the support I needed. And you know what? It really comes down to business. They need, they need a product to be consistent. I get it. To be in the same shape, more or less. I know they're dealing with humans. Um, they need the same output from that product. So if they're going to, if they paid for like um, red balloons and you're giving them like paper towels, I don't know. Like (laughs) I really do my best to make this analogy and I really haven't sat there and just thought out the perfect analogy for the scenario. Basically they want you to stay the same. They don't want to grow with you. It's not the fucking seventies anymore. No one gives a fuck. It's a fearful economy if something is working, they want to stick with that. And I get it. I understand. However, I decided to my because this is my life ultimately, to really just take my power back as soon as, as, soon as I have uh, the opportunity. And I did. And I grew. And I learned a shitload about music, about production, about myself. Um, and I had a blast exploring every musical category I could possibly explore you know it didn't all make money eventually i figured out how to make money and it has nothing to do with my music (laughs) it has to do with my voice and my ability to adapt to a certain feeling and and write write cater to exactly what like maybe a movie might need or a scene just cater to it just give it exactly what it needs and 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 write that song that's what I'm able to do in these new times, um, uh, in, in this new world. Uh, that's how I kind of maneuver and am able to pay my bills. And artistically, I'm, I, I'm so saturated in music. Like, I love the shit out of music, but there's just so much you could do with it by yourself in a room before you start to resent yourself and you, and you create this feedback loop. It's no longer fun. So I find... I have more fun like painting, you know, I know I'm still by myself, but 
painting is, it's not like you got to, you don't need a band to make a painting, you know? So I would have to divide myself into like, however musicians, the track needed, you know, and that just gets boring. You're, it's, it really becomes just a feedback loop. Too much, it's meta, it's too much of your own information constantly. So that, that's a very long-winded answer. I don't even remember what the question was. No, you answered what I was asking. And I'm curious with all that said and your entire journey and all that, if this is something that comes up when you talk to somebody like Mike Patton or somebody like Rozell who you've collaborated with as former major label artists who kind of hop genres and do the artistic right. thing rather than chasing hits, even though you have commercial success. Do you guys ever talk about this kind of journey? First of all, no one talks anymore. Um, second of all... I think we all just kind of understood that we went through it, you know, and there was just this unspoken understanding, you know, uh, maybe Mike and I had a few conversations about, you know, his commercial success. Maybe he might've was able to identify and relate and commiserate a little bit about what, you know, what you go through as that type of artist. I think that's kind of, we had that sort of connection um, and that understanding. Um, but, other than that, it's it's just about moving forward, pushing forward, and 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 putting out art and making sure this art means something to you, and trying to be as authentic as you possibly can in this day and age where it's nearly impossible. The world does not want you to be who you are, despite how fucking progressive everyone thinks they are with their fucking bullshit. Um, yeah, I'm calling it bullshit. I don't give a fuck. Whatever. It's annoying. I've been different since I was born. I never fucking asked for a parade. You know, or I just dealt with it, you know. Authenticity is something that just, it, it was something I had to do because I knew the world was against me. Um, and that's how I approach it artistically, too. I know that I, I'm i never going to find my way in, in, into mainstream music again. And the fact that I was there once, I consider them lucky more than I consider myself lucky. They got me at a time where before they bludgeoned my fucking soul and my spirit, they got me when I was young and fucking happy and full of love that I wanted to share, you know? So they're lucky. <laughs> um, and now I'm, I'm really doing my best to, to like really exhaustive self work to try to really put everything, all the fucking trauma from everything, you know, industry, the world right now, uh, childhood shit like just put it aside move the fuck on let go and and of course it's different when you're older you have your whole body chemistry is different and you're not as prone to accessing these really intense feelings of holy fuck i want to share this with the world now you're a little scared you're a little shy you're a little um hesitant and i'm really doing my best to kind of put that in its place and and relearn the purpose of me being here is not to be bitter, not to be pissed off, not to be disappointed. It's really to inspire people with all of the, their negative experiences, whether they're responsible for them or not. It's ultimately your role as a teacher, as a human, as a fellow human is to turn that shit into something positive that you can offer someone else looking for inspiration. That's really what, what we're supposed to be doing. I believe this. I really, well, at least this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And I get so caught up in what the stress of, you know, maintaining just being uh, an independent artist alone with no real support system. Um, doing all these projects, like every idea I have is another little child that needs attention, needs school clothes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it has its own schedule and it's just like fucking hey so um it's it's a whole different world it's not as carefree as it used to be and i think if i could really oversimplify my experience now uh in comparison to my experience then is i had so much support you know whether they were supporting me creatively or not no but they were there they were taking care of the business shit the tours you know the there was a tour manager, there was a band, there was a manager, there was a business manager, there were, there were agents, there were fucking fans, you know, there were people who had, it's just me, basically, and this label who's 
I appreciate the fact uh, that they are helping me with this album, but you know, there's just not enough budget or money or people in the, uh, to really push it. Like I would love to go on the road. No one has the money to pay for that, you know? And so you just have to appreciate what they are able to offer and they can offer exposure to their fan base and, and the people that they've gathered in their, you know, legacy of being the label that they are. And I just have to appreciate that. And, and, um, it's, you know, it gets frustrating sometimes. Um, I don't think people understand that everything that I bring to the table is coming the fuck out of my pocket. And it's usually me like just wearing myself out, spreading myself way too thin this is why I can't sleep. I have anxiety about all the shit I need to do. <laughs> so I'm losing sleep. And I'm also the artist who has to show up and perform and fucking kiss babies and fucking shake hands. And I just, I, I, uh, it's just not sustainable anymore for me. So it's very frustrating to talk about this album, having no sleep and, and trying to, to, to be exciting and optimistic and like sell it and, I'm usually, I want to cry when I'm getting interviewed because it's like, oh, someone give a shit about me. One thing that intrigues me about you beyond everything I've mentioned is that you're originally from Long Island, yet you were never really synonymous with the Long Island music scene. Were you playing out live at all when you lived on Long Island? In an orchestra? Yeah, I was part of an orchestra, part of a choir. That was my world. I was classical fucking through and through. I didn't play bands. I had no intention to ever play in a band. That was not what I set out to school to do. It was just something that happened. It was just a fucking fluke. And I went with it because I'm like, okay, well, I'm doing music professionally now. What's the point of going to fucking school for it? Might as well follow this through, you know? And so... So, yeah, the first show I played was a showcase in Atlantic City for my label. It was that was my that was my first experience playing with the band, you know. So, um, so yeah, I, I'm not part of the music scene in Long Island because I was a violin player and a student and a dork with no intention of ever, ever pursuing a, a career as a an artist, you know, that was not what I was trying to do. I wanted to write plays. I wanted to write films. Um, I wanted to score films. If anything, that was, that was what I was setting out to do was scoring. Cause I, I have a deep passion and love for classical music and deranging it and bringing it out of its, you know, comfortable um, environment and taking it into very bizarre places. Um, I think it's a very dramatic instrument. So, and I don't know, I was I was so into so many other things and I I thought, okay, well this is a way to kinda kinda put all of what I do. Not that I knew what the fuck I was doing then, but I could do a little bit of everything I wanted to do in that fucking recording studio. I could make my scores with my violin. You know, I could arrange things, I could go into character and, and sing in character and write in character to satisfy my more kind of musical theater um dramatic desires um i was able to touch upon a lot of things you know in one room with a microphone so i was like okay let me sit here for a second and see what that takes me and you know once you drop out of school and you're fucking plopped in new york city you're living in new york city at fucking 18 you don't know anybody but your business manager you just start kind of flailing and and clinging on to everything that whatever you have. And at that moment I had a record deal. I was considered, considered an artist and I was pursuing that, you know, and I just kind of developed it more, learned about myself more, took it to another level, uh, by learning other instruments. And obviously that changed your, that changes your sound you fall in love with every new instrument you play and, and that really um, influences how you're going to write, how you're going to sing, how you're going to feel for like the duration of your love affair. So I kind of just enjoyed that. I'm not trying to hate on the fact that I, I'm basically what I'm saying is um, 
probably when I should have completely walked away, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for listening to the Paltrowcast with Darren Paltrowitz on the Pure Grain Audio Network. More information on the Paltrowcast can be found online at www.puregrainaudio.com. Until next time, have a great Shabbos. Mm-hmm.